Good morning. We're just going to give a moment for everyone to arrive. Uh, we appreciate your patience. Okay, for anyone that just arrived, we're just gonna give a moment uh, to let everyone connect uh, and then we'll get started. Okay, it's just about three minutes uh, past uh, 10 a.m. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Kristen Nessenson, and I am the Director of Community Relations and Fundraising for the Histiocytosis Association. Uh, before we start today's focus on LCH and PLCH webinar, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. First and foremost, this webinar is meant for informational purposes only. Uh, it is not meant as a medical consultation. We encourage you to speak with your medical team about your specific circumstances. We will host a Q&A session at the end of the presentations, but due to time constraints, we may not be able to answer all of your questions. We will follow up, however, with additional information wherever possible. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will provide that recording to you at a later date. Uh, also note that all participants are muted. As I mentioned, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentations today. Uh, we will ask that you submit your questions via the Q&A box. Uh, you'll find that on your webinar toolbar. Uh, and once uh, you type your question in, we're gonna ask that you actually look to see if anyone else has uh, asked the same question or something similar. Uh, if so, you can upvote uh, the question by clicking the like button. Uh, this will show the panelists and our moderator the most popular questions first. There is also a chat box. Uh, this chat box will be used to ask questions of, uh, actually the panelists will ask this to use questions of our attendees today. Uh, but you can also uh, ask questions of the Histiocytosis Association. Uh, if you're having any issues, uh, you can use that box or you can email me, uh, Kristen at outreach at histio.org. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to try out the chat box now. Uh, if you could just let us know where you're joining us from today and we'll just make sure that everybody has, um, has use and function of the chat box. So we'll just give that a moment if you would just Enter that. It looks like uh, we have someone from Georgia. We have Texas, um, Southern California. Uh, hello. Um, Slovenia, uh, Pennsylvania, Chicago. Wonderful. It's working. So we appreciate you all being here. Um, and uh, good morning to all of you. And with that, I'd like to turn over the presentation uh, to your host today, Deanna Fournier, the Executive Director of the Histiocytosis Association. Yana. Thank you so much, Kristen, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone on the call today. Welcome to the latest webinar in our Histio Patient and Family Educational Webinar Series. Today, as Kristen mentioned, is on adult LCH and PLCH, and the webinar is dedicated to our adult patient community. We are pleased to welcome you to today's discussion. In order to ensure everyone is able to share in the experience, I'm going to run through a brief background of our esteemed panelists today. 
And then I will turn the presentation over to these speakers from various institutions who will be leading the remainder of our meeting today. We are joined by over 75 different individuals representing nine different countries. So that's incredible. And we are so thrilled to be able to have this opportunity to spend today with you. You are, uh, as Kristen mentioned, muted, but please feel free to engage with us throughout the presentation. So today we have joining you in this wonderful presentation, Dr. Omar Abdel Wahab, Hematology and Oncology from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, whose focus is on adult LCH, and Dr. Adele Abtif Tazi, Pulmonology from the French National Reference Center for Histiocytosis St. Louis Teaching Hospital in the University of Paris, Pulmonary LCH, and Dr. Eli Diamond, Neuro-Oncology Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, who is going to be moderating today's Q&A session. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Omar Abdel Wahab. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you so much to Deanna, Kristen, and the Histiocytosis Association for organizing this. And thanks to all the patients, families, and caregivers for attending this morning. Uh, I'm gonna start by giving a brief presentation um, on adult histiocytosis and then turn this over to Dr. Tazi, who's gonna talk to you all about pulmonary manifestations of histiocytosis. So just as a brief overview, Histiocytic disorders are an accumulation and proliferation of abnormal cells that are called histiocytes in affected tissues. The diseases are quite heterogeneous. They range from self-resolving single sites of disease in the body to disseminated life-threatening forms of the disease. And for a long time, it was unclear if histiocytoses represented inflammatory diseases like autoimmune diseases like lupus and things like that, or were they a form of cancer? And now it's believed that at least a subset of histiocytoses are real bona fide forms of blood cancers. And I'll talk about more what we mean by that uh, as we move forward. So we'll talk briefly about the clinical signs and symptoms of LCH in adults and treatment of LCH in adults. And today's webinar, as you all know, is focused primarily on adults. So just to give a little bit more background, there are multiple types of histiocytoses and names can be a little bit complicated. We currently think about them as two flavors, the Langerhans cell form of histiocytosis and the non-Langerhans cell histiocytoses, which consist of a variety of diseases like Erdheim Chester disease, juvenile xanthogranuloma, and other conditions shown here. So again, we're gonna focus mostly on Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and these are just some photos of different parts of the body affected in children with LCH, but we'll talk more as we move forward about adults with LCH. So uh, we think about LCH and its effects on the bodies in a variety of ways. There are those patients that have single sites of disease, like skin alone, versus multiple sites of disease, which is usually skin plus bone, but could also affect other organ sites that we'll talk about. And so with bone involvement, which is pretty common in LCH, we think about them as a single bone being affected versus multiple bones, and that influences potentially the treatment. In children, one of the most common um, kind of uh, classifications of the disease is whether or not there are risk organs involved. And risk organs in children with LCH refer specifically to involvement of the liver, bone marrow, or spleen. And when those sites of disease are involved in children with LCH, those are thought to be the highest risk forms of disease. But this classification is mostly uh, pertinent to children, not so much adults. Most pertinent to adults is really whether or not the central nervous system is involved. And we have Dr. Eli Diamond, uh, uh, Deanna mentioned earlier, who's a colleague of mine, a neuro-oncologist, who's focused on histiocytosis and effects on the nervous system. And Eli Diamond will be available for the question and answer session uh, at following these presentations. And then we mentioned also about pulmonary LCH and why we have a specific talk on that today, because this is really, it's its own distinct disease entity with its own ways of treatment. And Dr. Tazi will talk about that just after I finish. So moving forward, one of the most common sites of disease we mentioned for LCH is involvement of the skin and mucous membranes. And there are various pictures shown here of how LCH can affect the skin and mucous membranes. It can be anything from papular lesions, things uh, which you see primarily in children and infants, many times they're self-resolving, the things that look like eczema on the skin, and we'll refer to those in children as like a diaper rash or cradle cap, those can actually be manifestations of histiocytosis and LCH. 
occasionally it can cause ulcerative painful lesions in the mouth, as you can see in this picture, or the groin, genitalia, it could even look like gingivitis or dental problems. But it's also important to note that even though you can have these sort of symptoms, uh, symptomatic presentations, it can also be quite indolent, meaning very modest and slow affecting the body. Now, uh, beyond skin, the second most common side of the disease is bone or osseous lesions for histiocytosis. And here again, it's a pretty wide range of disease involvement. It could be anything from uh, what are called lytic or destructive lesions of bone that can cause pain and sometimes fracture, or it could just simply affect the bone um, and have really minimal symptoms or symptoms like pain at the site of the bone that's involved uh, and can even cause raised tenderness area in the skin overlying that part of the bone. And it's important to note that when the bone is involved, sometimes this can actually cause more generalized symptoms in the body like fevers and sweats. And um, I also just note here that occasionally it can involve the jawbone or mastoid bone. And that can sometimes, because of where the bone is located next to the ear, can mimic an ear infection. So even though the bone is involved, the patient may feel like they have actually what feels like an ear infection, but it's actually mastoid involvement of histiocytosis. Dr. Tazi will talk about lungs, and this is a really important manifestation of LCH. And again, it's really its own form of the disease in many cases, and he'll focus on that. Um, pertinent to what I do, I, I'm actually a hematologist oncologist. So I deal with cancers of the blood mostly, and histiocytosis is thought to be a cancer of the blood system in many cases. And with that, we can see sometimes lymph node involvement. You can see on this PET scan here, the lymph nodes around the neck and the armpits are being involved and sometimes can it also affect the bone marrow. And occasionally it can actually, uh, when it's in the bone marrow, cause reduced blood cell counts like anemia or low white blood cell counts. And so sometimes a bone marrow evaluation, a bone marrow aspirin biopsy is performed when evaluating histiocytosis patients. Um, but that is not necessarily a required part of the clinical evaluation of someone with histiocytosis. Really only when we think the hematopoietic system is being affected by histiocytosis. And you may not see bone marrow involvement on a PET scan, so that's just something important to be aware of. You may actually need a biopsy to prove that it's in the uh, bone marrow. Now, I mentioned earlier the central nervous system, so the brain and spinal cord, are a really important uh, site of disease for histiocytosis, particularly in the adults. And here we can see all parts of the central nervous system involved, anything from the brain stem to the um, lobes of the brain. And one really common and important manifestation of histiocytosis in the brain is when histiocytosis affects the pituitary gland, which sits right behind the eyes and is a site of hormone production in the body. And so one common manifestation when the pituitary gland is affected by histiocytosis can be the development of something called diabetes insipidus. This is different than diabetes mellitus, which is the really common form of diabetes that you all are familiar with, where the blood sugars of the body are not well controlled. In this case, the patients will have frequent urination, which can be seen in diabetes mellitus, but here it's due to an imbalance of the hormones that regulate uh, water and salt balance in the body produced from the pituitary. So there's lots of um, electrolyte and water balance abnormalities that are produced. And this can be a really common manifestation of histiocytosis. And very confusingly, this can actually be the first sign of the disease without any other disease in the body. And so it may not be really the first thing most doctors would think about to think about histiocytosis as a cause of diabetes insipidus. So something really important to be aware of. And the other hormones that can be influenced by this is the sex hormones, uh, like the testosterone and estrogen and hypogonadism particularly manifesting as low testosterone, can sometimes be seen uh, in adults with histocytosis when the pituitary is involved. So uh, one other manifestation, which is particularly important and really a, a big cause of morbidity in the patients that we see at our center when histocytosis affects the brain, is a really unique manifestation of nervous system histocytosis called neurodegeneration. So what the issue here is that this can happen many years after the diagnosis of LCH and even after successful treatment of LCH is that the patients may start to develop neurological symptoms like uh, imbalance, problems speaking, problems thinking. And it's thought that this is actually could be potentially like an autoimmune complication of histiocytosis. The exact pathogenesis is really not well understood 
Um, and this is something, that, again, that can pop up years following the actual diagnosis and treatment of LCH. And it's something that we may talk about further in the Q&A session. So uh, the last thing I'll just mention about the manifestations, and I saw a question from you all prior to um, the start of this session, is that occasionally patients with LCH can have coexistence of another form of histiocytosis, such as Erdheim chest disease or ECD. And we suspect this sometimes when a patient with LCH is treated as if they have LCH, and then they may actually have um, like a suboptimal response to LCH therapy, and we then diagnose them as having a coexistent or concomitant ECD. And here's a couple examples of patients from Dr. Diamond, where someone had a neurologic manifestation of LCH, and you can see the LCH in the brain, and they were treated with cytarabine, which we commonly use for um, histiocytosis when it has um, serious manifestations like this. And what we can see here is a spot in the brain of histiocytosis didn't respond very well. And then this led to the patient having a PET scan, and we see the telltale signs of ECD, which is involvement of the femur bones, as you can see here. And this is another very similar case. So this is something we sometimes suspect when patients have a suboptimal response to LCH therapy, that they might have a co coexisting additional form of histiocytosis, such as Erdheim Chester disease. And typically, these patients will have the BRAF gene mutation. And I'll talk about this in the next couple of slides. It's a really important point. So talking about treatment for LCH in adults. So here, the different manifestations that I talked about earlier of single site versus multiple sites, pulmonary versus non-pulmonary, are really important. So when a single site of the body is affected, oftentimes we can direct the treatment to just that site alone with potentially a surgical resection or low-dose radiation just to the site, or even if the site of the disease has really minimal effects on the body, we can just observe the patient. We don't necessarily need to treat them. If it's involving the pituitary with no other disease involvement, here's where hormone replacement therapy to correct this endocrine problem really becomes important, and there may not be any other need for therapy beyond that. Pulmonary LCH, of course, we covered by Dr. Tazi just after me in a few minutes. For multifocal, multi-system disease, this is really where the system, systematic or systemic treatment becomes really important. So we think about here, is it bone disease, skin disease, or multiple sites of disease? If it's bone disease primarily, if it's just a couple spots of disease, here again, radiation focused to those single individual spots may be uh, useful. However, if there's multiple spots, like more than three or three or more bones that are involved, here radiation really becomes much more difficult to treat this, and we need to think about systemic, systemic treatment, like kind of like chemotherapy. And so common chemotherapy used for this is oral low-dose weekly methotrexate, a chemotherapy pill called methotrexate or hydroxyurea. And we also need to think about treating the bone disease with bisphosphonates to try to stabilize or protect the bone from bone destruction. For skin-based disease, um, topical therapy and phototherapy can be utilized potentially. But if it's a large amount of the skin that's affected, we also begin to think about, again, oral low-dose weekly methotrexate or hydroxyurea, just like we talked about for bone disease. Now, with multiple sites of disease and multiple organs being involved, now we're thinking more about chemotherapy, particularly cladribine or cytarabine, which are forms of the cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, and the last possibility it's commonly used is a combination of prednisone steroid medication with the chemotherapy known as vinblastine. Those are the three most commonly utilized chemotherapy regimens for initial therapy for multi-system LCH. And these uh, chemotherapy regimens here are the most likely to actually give a curative treatment for patients with LCH. But it's important to note that the duration of treatment is still really not well defined. How long do we treat, uh, use these medications? It's not that well understood. The other things that I'm gonna focus on moving after this is this use of so-called targeted therapy that's really going after the mutations that we think are driving LCH. And this has been a really exciting story uh, and work that our group has uh, done a lot of effort on. And we'll talk about these next few slides. And these therapies are really important now when patients have multiple sites of disease that are refractory to these initial chemotherapy medications. That's what we think about their use currently. We also think about them when the central nervous system is involved and there's been an inadequate response to cladribine, cytarabine, or vinblastine and prednisone. 
So just a word about these mutations. So we're talking now about the BRAF B600E mutation. This is a gene, uh, the BRAF gene is affected by mutations at this specific site in many common forms of cancer like melanoma, colon cancer, thyroid cancer. And these, this gene mutation drives the, the transformation of the cells to become cancerous, to grow uncontrolled. And it was thought for a long time uh, that these uh, mutations were very rare in blood cancers until it was discovered that nearly 50% of patients with LCH have the same mutation. And this was a really dis exciting discovery because there was actually FDA approved inhibitor of BRAF in the form of a medication called Bemiraf and Zelbaraf, as well as a couple other BRAF inhibitors for BRAF mutant melanoma, colon cancer, and thyroid cancer. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry, just to mention this again. And this was now uh, utilized really successfully in many patients with BRAF mutant LCH. And here's just one example of a patient of ours. Uh, this is actually a patient with Erdheim chest disease, but you can see the sites of disease of the bone, pretreatment, and when they started Bemirafenib, a decrease in the uh, uh, disease within the bones. And we can actually measure the BRAF gene mutation, the blood of the patient, or even in this case, the urine of the patient. And you can see pretreatment, the amount of BRAF mutation circulating in the patient's body. And then when they started the drug, a precipitous drop in the detection of the mutation. Overall, across the world, there's probably been at least 100 patients with BRAF mutant adults with histiocytosis now treated with these therapies. And this is sort of technical terms, but the overall response rate shows that about maybe about two thirds of patients or so have really good responses to vemurafenib with multiple, multiple sites of disease involved in the body. And importantly, uh, we know from uh, solid tumor patients with the BRAF mutation that they can commonly get resistance to vemurafenib, but importantly, Resistance is very, very rare to develop in histiocytosis as far as we understand to date. In fact, there's only a single case of a patient with BRAF mutant histiocytosis that has developed resistance to this drug. So it seems to be a really efficacious therapy for patients with multi-site disease. Um, sorry, just a second here to advance the slides. Okay, I'm not... I feel like the slides may have frozen here for a second. I don't know, Deanna. Um, the, I'm seeing just a white slide. Okay, perfect. So this uh, resulted in FDA approval of uh, bemurafenib for BRAF B600E mutant adults with ECD. So this is currently not FDA approved for LCH or other forms of histiocytosis. However, it is commonly used for those conditions, and we can talk about that more moving forward. And this was FDA approved in 2017. Okay, but it's important to note that the uh, Vemiraf and the Rizelbaraf is only FDA approved for those patients that have the BRAF mutation. So at least 50% of patients with histiocytosis, adults and children, do not have the BRAF mutation. And what our work from our group and others identified is that for those patients that don't have a BRAF mutation, nearly all of the REFs have a mutation that activates a protein just downstream of BRAF called MEK. And it's really important to note that we also now have MEK inhibitors, such as a drug called cobimetinib or cotelic, that seems to work for many of those patients that do not have the BRAF mutation. And so this is just another example of an ECD patient that we treated with, uh, with uh, BRAF wild-type histiocytosis, cobimetinib, and you can see the disease involvement in the bones here and in the lymph nodes pre cobimetinib and on cobimetinib, a great resolution of those sites of disease in this PET scan. And here's just another example of the brain of such a patient. And you can see the sites of disease involvement of histiocytosis around the brain pre treatment versus on treatment. And so we have ongoing a phase two clinical trial, and Dr. Diamond can tell you more about this trial in the QA session for adults with any form of histiocytosis that's either BRAF wild type or BRAF B600E mutant that cannot get a BRAF inhibitor or are intolerant to a BRAF inhibitor that's ongoing at, Emma, at Sloan Kettering, but also I believe opening now at other sites and we'll, Eli can update, uh, Dr. Diamond can update us on that uh, in the Q&A session. And so far um, we've seen responses across different molecular gene mutations in histiocytosis patients being treated with this drug, as well as different forms of histiocytosis, including ECD, 
JXG, Rosei Dorfman disease, and adults with LCH. And so far in the published trial, we've had a follow-up of about uh, a year, 11.9 months, and nobody has had progression while on therapy. And so this resulted now in the FDA granting breakthrough designation for cobimetinib, this MEK inhibitor or Cotelic, for patients with BRAF wild type histiocytosis of any form. So LCH or non-LCH forms of histiocytosis, and that came in 2019. And so just to conclude, um, what we've learned today is that testing for gene mutations for the BRAF mutation and others is really, really important in LCH and ECD patients when they have multi-system disease because it could affect therapy. And it's also important in diagnosis. 50% of patients will have this BRAF B600E mutation. And we now have FDA approval of a BRAF inhibitor for adults with BRAF mutant ECD, but it again has utility in LCH as well. And a MEK inhibitor, cobimetinib, for adults with any form of histiocytosis regardless of the BRAF gene mutational status. And so we're now beginning to think about these diseases in our adult patients as more like different combinations of gene mutations, many of which are linked to many forms of targeted therapy medications which are administered orally, like BRAF inhibitors, MEK inhibitors, and others. And we still try to use chemotherapy initially, but these other therapies, targeted therapies, uh, are appearing to have great utility. And we can talk about this further in the Q&A session as well. So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Dr. Tazi. And just one second here. I will stop the control. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdel Wahab. Thanks to the uh, HSI Associated Association. I'm very pleased to be here. So with the background that gave uh, Dr. Abdel Wahab, I'll try to go more specifically through adult pulmonary longer hand cell LCH. Um, with the, I don't have the control yet. Can I get the control? Okay, so um, what I thought what might be useful is to go through this topic from a practical point of view and try to address the following questions. First, to see what is pulmonary LCH. Second, to uh, see what are the circumstances of discovery of the disease, to give you some information about the clues of the diagnosis and how to assess the consequences of PLCH, to show you the different possible outcomes, and I will comment on this, on the frequency of each, what initial evaluation we perform and how we manage patient in clinical practice, and we'll see at the end what are, at least in my opinion, the important pending questions. So uh, the first thing is that PLCH is a rare diffused cystic lung disease. That means it makes holes in the lung. As said Dr. Abdel Wahab, the lesions are characterized by the accumulation of specific cells of LCH. Uh, and in the lung, they issue in an infiltration and destruction of the walls of the small airways that we are everywhere in the lung. And that's why we call it rather a bronchiolitis, that it's a, a disease of the little uh, airways. However, other compartment of the lung may be involved. And it is interesting to have in mind because sometimes the, phen the phenotype of the patient is different either because the lung vessels are more involved and thus give pulmonary hypertension, or because uh, of involvement of lung parenchyma, it may be more diffused in the Asha city, as I will show you. It is a disease of young adults with a peak incidence of between 20 and 40 years. It affects equally both genders, and actually uh, females may be a little bit more older. It can be either isolated, and in my center we see essentially pulmonary disease, uh, but we don't have only isolated PLCH, that means only the lung. It may be part of multisystem LCH. And in these cases, the most frequent extra pulmonary localization are the bone, the pituitary with diabetes insipidus, and less frequently the skin. Just to give you an idea, in our uh, center, we have about 450 patients followed, and we have about 25% with multisystem 
LCH associated with the lung and 75% with isolated pulmonary LCH. The mechanism is the similar to LCH in general, that is a MAP, MAP kinase pathway with a different mutation Dr. Abdul Wahab have spoken to. And the main feature of uh, this uh, particular presentation of LCH is very strong link with smoking, tobacco smoking. And that might be interesting to discuss what are the mechanisms that might explain this important link. In our registry, uh, we have about 15 to 20% of patients who also smoke cannabis. So uh, there are three circumstances that can induce the diagnosis of the discovery of the disease. The first one is the most frequent in two thirds of patients is uh, uh, respiratory symptoms that are not specific, shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, and sometimes wheezing. And it is interesting to know that in about 15 to 20% of cases, you, have, you may have constitutional symptoms. And in these cases, you have to consider alternative diagnosis more frequent, particularly infection. A particular feature of this cyst in the lung is, is that they can disrupt in the pleural cavity and then the air goes in the pleural cavity and it, uh, the patient experiences a pneumothorax in about 10 to 20 percent. And interestingly, in a, um, a rather significant proportion of patients, it can be discovered through a systematic uh, high-resolution computed tomography. So uh, the most important uh, investigation to uh, um, suggest and make the diagnosis is high-resolution computed tomography of the lung, which is absolutely mandatory in this setting. I will show you some examples. Clinically, it is very important to search for extrathoracic LCH localization, as I told you. Uh, particularly bone or the skin that can be accessible or ready, readily accessible for biopsy. The lung is more difficult to biopsy. We perform more frequently, I guess, in Europe than in the United States bronchoscopy for two reasons. Either to make transbronchial biopsies, and actually there are very few centers who perform these biopsies because there is a risk of pneumothorax because of the cysts or uh, a bleeding in the lung, and you have to have an important expertise of your pathologist. We perform what we call bronchoalveolar lavage, that means that we infuse some ser physiological serum and then take it back and analyze the cells, and essentially to show that this, the profile of the cells that we cover is um, consistent with smoking, and it is essentially useful to discard other diagnoses. For example, if we have lymphocytes in bronchoalveolar lavage, we can say that it is not pulmonary LCH. And the gold standard for the diagnosis is surgical lung biopsy, which is currently performed through a video thoracic surgery. It is a case-by-case -case decision. It depends on the expertise of the center, and it depends also on the imaging presentation, as I will show you, and also on the, the impairment of lung function because it's must, it must be safe for the patient. So just some examples, typical example of what shows long high resolution computer tomography. As you can see here, you have this typical association of nodules, these white dots that can be cavitated as here or can be only cysts and these are uh, present both in the part, in old part of the lung, essentially in the upper part. It can be more extensive. And if the disease evolves, which is not always the case, of course, it can become very uh, cystic lung disease. And of course, when you have an extent of cyst in the lung, the lung function is impaired. It can also be complicated with pneumothorax. This one is very easy to see here, but be careful, this patient has also um, uh, a uh, contralateral pneumothorax, which means that it has been to be treated very quickly. So with this aspect, the three of these, and even also this one, the diagnosis in a, a compatible clinical setting is highly suggested. Um, the consequences, the main consequence is the impairment of lung function. I will not go in details in the uh, profiles of lung function because it's a, a specialist uh, issue, but Patients get shortness of breath and the function can be altered, 
particularly the gas exchange and oxygenation. And which is important to have in mind is that the impairment of lung function is directly correlated to the extent of lung cysts in the lung. This is important because in some situations, as I will talk about, the cyst, the, the, the impairment of lung function is not due to PLCH. It induces a rather early exercise limitation and it can induce pulmonary hypertension in the minority of patients. And then we use Doppler echography to uh, um, monitor these patients. So what are the outcomes? The first one to have in mind is that a substantial proportion of patients will have a spontaneous resolution, particularly after smoking cessation. I will show you uh, two examples. Um, about 50% of patients will have a stability of lung function, but if they resume smoking, then they can have a flare of the disease. Pneumothorax recur in about half of the patient who had initially a pneumothorax, and it can be difficult to treat, but in general, it resolves within the first two years. The lung function deterioration, the, mo the, more important, the most important issue is the respiratory failure that needs oxygen and this kind of treatment. And it is important to have in mind that it's only a minority of patients if you uh, have a large cohort, as we recently performed on more than 200 patients, it's about less than 5% of patients who get uh, respiratory failure. And it occurs early in the course of the disease, that is within the first five years. But this is an important issue. It may be associated with pulmonary hypertension. And what was I talking before about is that in some time, because the patient continued to smoke, the LCH by self, by per se, has resolved, but still he develops smoking-related COPD. And of course, the treatment is not the same. Um, the occurrence of extrathoracic involvement uh, in, uh, after an isolated PCH in adults at diagnosis is, occurs only in a minority of patients. This is based on the prospective study on 206 patients followed for a median time of five years and 75% for more than eight years. And on about 6% developed essentially bone lesion and diabetes encephalitis. An important consideration is that these patients, and probably not only about because of smoking, uh, have an increased risk of lung cancers and other malignancies, but this is also for the other malignancies, I guess, the case for uh, other form of LCH. And the, if you look at the literature and the uh, uh, two old uh, retrospective study, you may be a little bit scared because the uh, survival, the median survival is said to be about uh, 12 and 0.5 years, which is not the case in our prospective study when you take patient early in their diagnosis and we have a survival of 93% at 10 years. So it's, it's much better than it is thought to be. So just to show you the viable outcomes that can be impressive and spontaneous, this patient results spontaneously completely at the RCT. This one had a very impressive nodular lesions and the result. So it can happen in a substantial part of patients. On the other hand, you can have patients who have a progression, as you can see on this disease, in this case, excuse me, and finally, uh, the disease may resolve, as you can look here, the, the, the lesion had resolved, but the patient developed pneumothorax, which is another decision concerning the therapy. It's not the treatment of LCH, it's the treatment of pneumothorax. So how do we manage this patient in practice? First, smoking cessation is absolutely essential. We have done a few years ago a prospective study, multi center, showing that when patients stop smoking for at least six months or more, then the risk of deterioration of lung function was clearly decreased. It is easy to say, it is difficult to obtain in these patients. And in about 30% of these patients, it is the only intervention needed. We start most frequently with an observation that is what I said, we're called wait and see first. We can use bronchodilators and corticosteroid inhalation, particularly in patients who may have some, what we call uh, bronchial hyperactivity. Just to say to women that pregnancy per self, uh, LCH per self, PLCH per self does not have any impact on, on pregnancy, except that uh, delivery may be cesarean because of impairment of lung function and risk of pneumothorax. But in some cases, what happens is 
an exacerbation or an occurrence of diabetes insipidness during or after the birth. The main issue is that blasting, which in Europe is the first line therapy for multisystem LCH, doesn't work. So clavulibine is currently the first line therapy for patients with PHCS who are progressive. It may be very effective. I will show you one case, but it's inconstant. There are no multi-center trials. There, are, there is only one small uh, phase two study that we performed that we cannot go through it today, but it's about 60% of patients who have a real improvement in their lung function. It is highly immunosuppressive and we don't know what is the long-term efficacy. Uh, the, the study we performed was followed for five years, so we have the results. Of course, we consider targeted treatment, as Dr. Omar Abdel Wahab talked about, as a salvage treatment. In the literature, to my knowledge, there is only one case that we have reported of a young patient who had pulmonary HCH initially responding to cladribine and secondarily um, um, uh, progressing and even we gave him two additional uh, cycles of cladribine, it didn't, it didn't work. And because uh, he had um, a, a MAC mutation, to say it, uh, to say it uh, simply, he had received a MAC inhibitor and he's still on it and he's doing well. Uh, contrary to, uh, to uh, the children, at least in PLCH, there is no correlation between BRAF mutation and uh, lung function outcome of severity. And at the end, if we don't have the other solution, we can propose lung transplantation in a very small minority of patients. And uh, globally, the results are similar to that uh, obtained from, for other diffuse lung diseases. So just to show you an example of how cladrimine can be effective, this is a patient who came to us because he had multi-system LCH with pulmonary LCH, as you can see. Regional, particularly because when he, in, he, when he was a very young child, he had non pulmonary multi system LCH treated with different lines of chemotherapy. Then he started to smoke when he was a teenager, and this is an important step. And then he developed lung disease, and he came and then blasting given for multi system disease didn't work on his disease, so he received cladribin as second line. And you can see that on this uh, lung CT. There is a clear improvement of the cyst at six months. He received four months of treatment, and four years after that, he was doing very well. It was impressive to see all these cysts resolving, the cysts resolving on CT scan. Of course, the main objective is to improve lung function. In, in this patient, it improved. But as I told you, about 50% only of patients improved. So, um, the management must also consider the specific uh, treatment of pneumothorax, which is tricky. And you have to go to specific uh, uh, and specialist uh, thoracic surgeons. Uh, patient may need oxygen supplementation, pulmonary rehabilitation, which is useful for dyspnea and, uh, and uh, shortness of breath. Pulmonary hypertension may need exceptionally specific treatment in expert center, but which is important systematically is to make vaccination against flu and pneumococcus, like in other uh, disabating uh, lung diseases, and avoid uh, dust exposure, either mineral or organic at home or occupation. So we follow the patient actually very simply with a clinical examination, chest X-ray, lung function, closely in the first two years, two to three months, three to six months for the six, two years, and then we do it to six to one, six months to 12 months later. And it is important to follow this patient for a long time, at least five years. We can put, we put sometimes the patient in smoking uh, cessation dedicated programs. Long city are too much performed. We do it only if there is a particular event and we have to watch out of the risk of lung cancer in this patient. And if there is a specific nodule, it might be cancer. And in case of suspicion of pulmonary hypertension, as I told you, we do Dr. Echogram. So actually, where do we stand today? We have found that age, the older age and deterioration at diagnosis, particularly uh, a parameter that we measure that is called FUV1, is associated with survival. That is, if there is an impairment of FUV1 or an older age at diagnosis in multivariate analysis, it is associated with the risk of mortality. The real question is how to predict patients who will have deterioration of lung function early in the, after the diagnosis. And particularly, 
those who are at risk to develop respiratory failure within five years and those who might need absolute treatment to prevent these events. So we're looking at to try to find biomarkers for that. And a question which is difficult to answer is how many patients have a complete and sustainable resolution of the disease? And I think we'll have the answer uh, soon. We have to better select patients for plenary. We don't have any serious a marker that will predict the response. HLCT may be helpful, but it's not robust. Maybe blood markers would be uh, useful. And the place of targeted therapy, although useful as a salvage therapy, as we have performed but only in one patient, is not uh, so easy to define in PLCH. And particularly, as uh, Dr. Abdul Wahab, I guess, said, there are suspensive treatment. That means when you stop the treatment, the disease will occur. And we have to better understand the mechanism of increased risk of lung cancer because these patients have increased lung of cancer, risk of lung cancer, outweighing the fact that they smoke. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Eli Diamond, who will be moderating the Q&A portion. I, I see a few questions here that I'll pose um, to uh, Dr. Tazi, just to, um, if you could clarify one um, point. One of the um, participants has asked, um, uh, what, what is the, um, how does the progression to severe pulmonary hypertension happen if the disease itself may not be changing? I think you're muted. I didn't hear the question, actually. How, how does the progression um, to, to severe pulmonary hypertension happen? If you could just explain a little bit how the pulmonary hypertension worsens over time. What is the proportion? No, what, 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 just how does that process happen? Of the oh, how does it come? There are two kinds of pulmonary hypertension in this patient. Either it is secondary to hypoxemia because of respiratory failure, and you know when you have hypoxemia, you have constriction of uh, pulmonary vessel, which is a mechanism of response to hypoxemia. And these patients have the need for oxygen supplementation. But in pulmonary LCH, um, there is a, a small proportion of patients who might develop a specific vasculopathy of uh, pulmonary vessels of the lung, particularly the venules, and they have a very high pulmonary hypertension, as we previously reported, and this patient might uh, benefit from a specific anti-pulmonary hypertension treatment. But it has been to be done in very uh, uh, expert centers because there is always a risk when you open the vessels that you might have a, a decrease in oxygenation in the blood. But there is a specific mechanism that is a vasculopathy in this, in this, in this, uh, in this disease. Okay, um, then just another question about PLCH. Um, any general suggestions for management of cough? Well, we try to give uh, bronchodilatators and uh, corticosteroid inhalers. It might work. In some patients, we actually, the first step is stop smoking, and then we gave the association of corticosteroids and long-acting bronchodilators by inhalation, and it works in a substantial proportion of patients. Okay. Um, one question that, um, that I'll take is how does, um, how does someone get the BRAC mutation tested for their LCH? So this is something that can be done on uh, biopsy material that you've had in the past. Um, a, um, a pathologist can do a stain on one of the biopsy slides, um, and that may or may not be a great test to see whether your LCH has a BRAF mutation. Um, a better option is to, um, uh, uh, to take some of the material from a biopsy and do gene testing um, for, for the BRAF V600E mutation. Um, uh, and uh, nowadays, that material can be tested for BRAF and for other mutations all at the same time, um, and that's called next-generation sequencing. That's when biopsy material is sent for testing of many mutations all um, at the same time. Um, and if someone has um, active LCH, but for one reason or another, um, there isn't um, uh, LCH material available, there are some uh, blood tests that can be done to look for the BRAF mutation um, in the blood. 
If your LCH is in remission, then that's not um, a very useful test. Um, another uh, question is about whether the Mirafinib treatment is um, specific for the BRAF V600E mutation or whether it would be appropriate treatment for um, other uh, BRAF mutations. So I'll, I'll say broadly um, that um, it, it's really uh, mainly for BRAF V600E or very similar, um, something uncommon called BRAF V600K, but which are mutations really in the exact same area of the gene, um, but that we would not expect bemurafenib um, to work for other mutations um, in the BRAF gene. And um, Omar, I don't know if you want to comment on that any further. Yeah, no, just to stress that, as, as Dr. Diamond said, uh, it's really critical for BRAF inhibitors that um, there has to be documentation that the BRAF V600 mutation is there. Uh, it doesn't have to exactly be V600. E. There are other um, changes that are sensitive, but it ha you, there has to be the BRAF mutation. Otherwise, it could actually be dangerous to take the BRAF inhibitor. So it's really, really important to be aware of that. Um, I actually wanted to add, uh, Dr. Diamond, do you think it will be a good time to talk about that MSK Make an Impact program at all, or should we talk, mention that or leave that? Yeah, for yeah time? sure, that's fine. Um, um, uh, we have an initiative uh, here to do BRAF and other testing on really pretty much any patient's histiocytosis sample um, you know, in the US or worldwide. So um, if, if your LCH material has not uh, been tested, uh, and um, it may be relevant to your care. That's something that we that we could do, and you can um, contact me offline about that, and I'm happy to facilitate that testing. Um, I see uh, one question about um, COVID, um, and there really has not been very much uh, experience with LCH patients um, getting COVID infections. Um, you know, any, any person who has a suppressed immune system, you know, from active chemotherapy may be more vulnerable to more severe um, infection. Um, but we have, uh, but generally speaking, I don't think that there has been much of an observation of, um, of, of different outcomes. And I don't know if anyone, uh, the, Dr. Tazi, you, I don't know if you've had any other experience with that. No, I fully agree. We, had, we didn't have any patient uh, in our center who had COVID. But the patient had been very cautious. They had stayed at home at the time where the pandemic was very strong here and wear a mask and uh, uh, physical distanciation. Actually, uh, I don't think there is a particular issue with pulmonary LCH and COVID-19, except that it is the same as other lung diseases that it depends on the importance of impairment of lung function. It means if you have very few symptoms, very few sick in the lung, everything will be okay. But if you have respiratory failure or impairment of lung function, of course, you have to be very cautious about this virus. Um, I see a couple other questions here. Um, can the neurologic aspects of LCH mimic Parkinson's disease? Um, I would say yes and no. Um, if it's very, very, very typical for Parkinson's, um, then probably not, but it kind of depends on your age and whether Parkinson's is a, a sensible idea for someone like you. Um, a neurologist may be able to, um, to sort that out. Um, someone asked, what's the quickest time frame of success for the oral medications? So generally speaking, the gene targeting medications like BRAF and MEK inhibitors, they tend to improve um, health and symptoms um, uh, within a few weeks. So they, they, if they're effective, they tend to be effective relatively uh, quickly. Um, Deanna, do, do you want to take over or should we have time for more questions? We're pretty much, we've gotten through most of these. Yeah, I mean, if there are one or two more, we probably mm -hmm. have time for that. Uh, leave that up to you. But if, if we're ready to wrap up, we always um, collect the questions after as well and can follow up with answers to any, any unanswered questions. Um, I see a question about um, the a MEK inhibitor being used um, for someone who um, their LCH was BRAF negative, but uh, no other gene mutation was found. Um, and that's, um, uh, some would consider that a very acceptable approach because we believe that whatever mutation is present would be sensitive to a MEK inhibitor. So if, if someone needs a treatment, 
and the BRAF is negative, then um, the MEK inhibitor uh, would be considered very appropriate. Um, Eli, I see, and this is a good question, I think, uh, very timely. There's a question about vaccinations for uh, pneumonia, uh, flu, chickenpox, shingles. Are there any recommendations, Dr. Tazi or Dr. Diamond, uh, for histiocytosis patients for vaccines, or how, how do we approach that? Well, for, for pulmonary LCH, it's clearly indicated because the risk of uh, exacerbation of decompensation of uh, lung function impairment in uh, pulmonary disease in general and LCH, pulmonary LCH in particular, are outweighing the, any risk of vaccination. So it's very important that these patients get vaccinated to, against flu at pneumococcus, as I presented earlier. I agree. I generally encourage, you know, um, age-appropriate vaccinations. Um, one other good question just while we're here is, um, I see someone's also asking about what causes the generalized bone pain um, in adults with bone manifestations of histiocytosis. Dr. Diamond, do you have thoughts on that? No, so bone pain is a really, really um, frustrating problem that um, histiocytosis patients have. and. Um, there can be individuals who have lung-only LCH and have very severe and diffuse joint and bone pain, and that's not a very well understood phenomenon, but I have seen it before. Um, and it's unclear whether that's a result of uncontrolled inflammation in the body or whether it's LCH in the bone that we're not seeing. Um, but it would be important for people to know that um, unexplained pain is something that can be seen um, in LCH. Deanna, do you want to take the last two minutes? I think we're getting there. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. First, want to just extend a very warm and, and gracious thank you to Dr. Abdel Wahab, Dr. Diamond, and Dr. Tazi. I really appreciate you taking time today to, to sit with us as a community and to discuss all of this information. This is very beneficial and very helpful. For anyone who asked a question and we weren't able to address it, we will be going through the questions and try to pull together a Q&A resource for everyone who's on the webinar. And as Kristen mentioned, we will be sending out a recording as well. Just wanna bring attention to a few quick things before we wrap up. First, we pull together what we call the COVID-19 Histio Hub, which is an information hub to help you continue to navigate your way through COVID-19 as a Histio okay. patient or caregiver. You, we include links from the CDC, medical articles related to histiocytic disorders from reputable sources, and other resources that you can uh, take advantage of, such as entertainment uh, for families and children, mental health and wellness, and education. We also have Histio Open Stage, where you can submit videos if you'd like. You can view performances on our Facebook and website, and this is just an opportunity to engage with the community and to see fellow Histio warriors and families. And then we have a resource directory if you haven't visited that yet. We have information around clinical trials, um, different resources you can use when you're navigating potentially the insurance space or the medical space, financial um, considerations. So lots of resources available for you to explore if you haven't. Also, we just want to bring attention to the fact that we're days away from September and September is Histiocytosis Awareness Month. Please participate in a variety of activities. We'll be sending out more information about that. And you also can use our hashtag, I know throughout the month of September on social media to help raise awareness. As you know, awareness is one of the most important elements of, of getting histiocytosis um, education out there, bringing more awareness for potential um, opportunities to improve patient outcomes and things of that nature. So please participate in Awareness Month and help us spread the word. Also, just wanted to let you know of a couple of upcoming events. The successful work done by the Histiocytosis Association is a direct result of the collaborative nature of our community and the desire and willingness of everyone to get involved in their own way, from connecting to organizing fundraising campaigns and events and donating in support of the association. There are limitless opportunities and we can't do what we do without you, so we thank you so much. Um, coming up, we have our Play for Your Cure softball tournament and that you can find information about that on our website. So that's September 11th through 13th. 
And then we also have our camp out for Histio on September 12th, and that is a global opportunity to participate in a, a fundraising um, campaign as well as just an exciting and engaging way to get together and connect with your family and raise awareness about histiocytosis. So definitely check out our website and find out more about both and keep your eyes peeled for emails where we'll share more information. There are a variety of ways to support the association. I know I'm shopping a lot more online, so I always make sure when I shop on Amazon that I use Amazon Smile so that a small portion of my, um, my purchases on Amazon go to the association at no cost to you. And then there's also ways to donate on our site. And if we don't currently have your email, or you're not receiving any communications from us, please feel free to let us know and we can add you to our mailing list or you can find us on social media to stay connected with us. And more importantly, to stay connected with your community, uh, your mm -hmm. fellow warriors and um, family members as well. So again, just want to say thank you so much to our esteemed panel. We very much appreciate your time today. And thank you so much to Kristen and to the association for helping put on this presentation. And also thank you to all of you for being here with us today. And we hope that you just take a couple of minutes after our uh, webinar to just participate in a survey so that we can continue to improve future events like this and get feedback on what else you'd like to see in the future. Thank you all so much. We hope that you're staying safe and having a great summer. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.